we had a we had a, a, a challenge. Uh, each of us was uh, asked to choose a text from rabbinic period. I can also already tell you that none of us did one text. We all did a bunch of those, but we were supposed to choose. Oh, maybe Chris was better than us. Uh, and uh, we 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 had to choose a text or, or or a concept in rabbinic literature. Read the text and reflect. And the idea is that each of us is going to present that by for 15 minutes, and I'll be very strict with time, Chris. 16. 16. Okay. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, exactly uh, and and introduce the text and raise questions or thoughts about that text. And then we'll send this, this is gonna be 45 minutes and then we'll spend some time, 20 minutes or so discussing it between us, saying how they, how the texts respond to each other. Do they have a connection? Can we, can we show what's similar, what's different and, and, and concepts about conversion in rabbinic literature or the status of the converts. And then we'll open up for questions and answers. So that's the format of this session of uh, uh, rabbinic literature. And we're gonna start uh, chronologically because Chris did the uh, earlier Tanaitic uh, uh, layers of rabbinic literature and Moshe and I chose a uh, text from the Babylonian Talmud. So Chris, the floor is yours for exactly 16. Um, I, thank you. I need 17 because I'm not able to share. So if I can be allowed to share, then I can share the text um, with our viewers at home. Uh, so everyone should have a handout. And what I'd like to do is actually just give you one minute to read the text. Uh, that way I don't have to show it the whole time. I just want you to have the text in your head before I discuss it. Am I able to share? I don't know. <clears throat> now? No. Wait, 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 so, I'll, do I'll do it. I'll do it. But I don't know how to. So why don't the other participants, and this doesn't count within my 15 minutes, why don't the other participants um, go ahead and read either in the Hebrew or the English. It doesn't matter. I just want you to have the text in oh. mind. Chris, can I share now? Yes. Can you share? Yes. So for people at home, I'm sorry, um, I'll give you a little bit of time with the Hebrew, a little bit of time with the English. Does anyone have Chris's handout? Yeah. Uh, hopefully most people are okay with the Hebrew. I will just put a little bit of time here on the English. There's a final little section. Okay, it looks like Michal is done. So I'm gonna assume other people are done as well. And I'll go ahead and get started now. Um, so the text that I've selected is from the Michilta de Rabbi Ishmael. Uh, it has an additional paragraph. There's a parallel in Sifre Midbar. And so um, I, I gave one extra little um, section of that text as well, um, because it sort of completes the thought. And we have this story in various ways um, in other places in rabbinic literature. And this passage belongs to a genre of texts that portray biblical figures involved in what some people refer to as missionary activities. Uh, and such activity may entail spreading Torah to non-Jews or integrating them into Israel in some fashion, sometimes referred to as bringing them under the wings of the Shekhinah as here. Um, and as Moshe Levi has noted, these texts are found in Palestinian rabbinic sources. They appear very rarely in the Babylonian Talmud. Why? Well, some have suggested that rabbinic engagement with or accommodation of interested Gentiles, discursive and real, arose in competition with Christianity, or perhaps in competition with the Roman grant of universal citizenship in the third century. 
Um, but Ketel Bertolo has noted that Jewish engagement with interested Gentiles predates both of these phenomena. And she suggests that it has more to do with the Roman ideology of enfranchisement. And she clearly demonstrates the impact of the ideology of enfranchisement on Philo and Josephus. She's reluctant to construe the tendency of Palestinian rabbinic texts to welcome converts as a response to Roman enfranchisement policies. Uh, and that's fair. Um, she focuses on the way Roman models of citizenship affected the concrete substance of rabbinic laws around conversion. Um, but I'm less cautious, and I will suggest that this text um, stems from, and related texts, stem from the same competitive engagement with the Roman ideology of enfranchisement that motivated Philo and Josephus. So Cattell has this brilliant demonstration of, or a set of sources um, that show that ancient writers praised the Romans for their willingness to bestow citizenship on foreigners, even enemies, and transform them into fellow Romans. And she cites Cicero and Livy and Tacitus, who contrasts the Roman practice of rallying the best men from various ethnic origins um, with the Greek refusal to integrate those that they've conquered because of their alien birth. And Cattell notes that not all Romans approved this practice. Seneca, for example, mocks the deceased Emperor Claudius for his desire, quote, to see the whole world in the toga, Greeks, Gauls, Spaniards, Britons, and all. Keep this text in mind. We're going to refer to it again. But in general, Roman and pro-Roman discourses extol and praise Rome's benevolence, philanthropia, fairness, and humanitas as expressed in its openness to foreigners, again, in contrast to the Greeks who jealously guarded their noble birth and granted citizenship to none or to very few. And by the way, that was an innovation by Pericles, uh, who in the mid fifth century, 451, 450, um, and possibly following its extensive engagement with the genealogically conscious Persians, uh, limited Athenian citizenship to persons with two Athenian parents. That was an innovation prior to that. Uh, anyone whose father was an Athenian who was freeborn um, could be an Athenian citizen, but Pericles in 450 limited Athenian citizenship to persons with two Athenian parents, an innovation that should be cited more regularly uh, when thinking about Ezra's very similar move, Ezra also uh, reflecting Persian norms. Anyway, Cattell argues that Rome's enfranchisement policy and the abundant praise it received through the fifth century had an impact on Jewish thinking about their own community. We see it in the writings of Philo and Josephus. They engage in a kind of competitive apologetics, characterizing Israel as welcoming to foreigners and similarly deserving of praise. Philo points to Deuteronomy 23, which accepts a third generation Egyptian, despite Egypt's harsh treatment of the Israelites. This is a sign of the humanity and benevolence and generosity of the Mosaic law. Josephus in Against Appion also confutes or accusations of Jewish misanthropy by pointing to the fact that foreigners are welcome and can attain citizenship in Israel. So I submit that the competitive apologetic is not confined to Hellenistic Jewish authors, but continues in rabbinic sources as well, and we see it in this passage. Um, and there are other studies at the moment that have shown a Jewish competitive apologetics at work in um, rabbinic literature. Um, and so here too, I think that um, rabbis um, eager to represent themselves as the pinnacle of civilized humanity according to prevailing criteria in the broader culture, they emphasize the warm welcome extended by Moses to Yitro and to Moses's descendants uh, by Moses's descendants to Yitro's descendants down through the generations. Uh, certainly the Kenites were not enemies, but in important respects, this midrash is continuous with the representations found in the writings of Philo and Josephus, and in some respects it's different. Um, but the main claim is that Israel shares with Rome a generous enfranchisement policy, proving Israel's benevolence and humanitas. So can we prove that this text is a response to Roman citizenship policy and ideology? Well, perhaps not, but there are certain linguistic and conceptual echoes that I think are highly suggestive. And at the very least, they signal a rabbinic awareness of and response to the extension of Roman citizenship, especially through the manumission of slaves. So let's look at the text more closely. The verse that's under discussion here is Shemot 1827, which begins with the verb shileach, and Moses sent out uh, his father-in-law. This verb, shilach, is the verb that's used to describe a slave's manumission in Deuteronomy 
as opposed to Exodus, where the slave simply goes out, yatsa. But in Deuteronomy 15, we read that after six years of service, you shall send him out free from you. And similarly, Roman manumission procedures use the equivalent Latin term, emito, to send out. For example, the term is used in the manumissio vindicta, which is one of the oldest of several modes of Roman manumission. The master is said to turn the slave around and send him out. So Plautus has describes this with several terms, misit manu or a misit a manu. And it's from this word that we derive the very word manumission, sending him out from under his hand or potestas, his power. So our verse in which Moses sends Yitro would have resonated in the rabbinic mind, not only with Deuteronomy 15's reference to manumission, sending out the slave, but also with contemporaneous Roman modes of manumission in which slaves were sent out into citizenship. That the rabbis read Moses's action as an act of manumission grounded in the use of the verb shileach helps to explain the comments by Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Elazar HaModai. Rabbi Elazar Hamodai says that Moses gave Yitro many gifts, now alluding perhaps to Deuteronomy 15.13, which states, uh, When you send him out free from you, do not send him out empty-handed. But what about the statement of Rabbi Yoshua? Uh, he says that Moses sent him, shel olam. He sent him with the honor of the world. What does this peculiar statement mean? I submit that Rabbi Yoshua invokes not the biblical model of manumission, but the Roman model of manumission here. As we know, under certain conditions, manumission was a path to citizenship. That was a unique Roman practice, and it was the model for the rabbinic creation of a similar process. But why do I think Rabbi Yoshua has this Roman model in mind? Roman citizenship, as Cattell's wonderful book uh, reminds us, grants three things. It grants certain rights, it grants certain duties, and it also grants participation in the majesty, the maestas of the Roman people. And she points to Josephus's reference to persons of the equestrian order who were Jews by birth, but of Roman dignity. He uses the word axioma, but it's a synonym of maestas, majesty or dignity. Emancipation brought citizenship, which meant participation in the majesty or dignity of the Roman people. Could the association of newly bestowed citizenship with participation in the dignity of the people explain the otherwise, to me, inexplicable statement that Moses sent Yitro out, Bikvodo shel olam? In other words, like a Roman master, he manumitted him, conferring upon him citizenship and along with it, the honor or dignity, not merely of the political state, but of the whole world, since God's dominion extends over the whole world. And if so, Rabbi Yoshua is engaged in a competitive apologetic. Membership in Israel also brings dignity, but it's a higher dignity than that of the Roman state. Incidentally, a second form of Roman manumission, manumission by the census, entailed the master giving property to the slave. It's possible then that both Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Elazar Modei draw upon modes of manumission known to them from their Roman environment. And since I'm speculating wildly, let me suggest that the next scene in our Midrash is informed by yet a third Roman model of manumission. In the next scene, we find a dialogue between Moshe and Nitro. And uh, Moshe urges Yitro to stay, but Yitro asks to be released so that he can teach Torah and bring others under the wings of the Shechina. This may reflect a mode of Roman manumission known as manumissio sacrorum causa, in which a master declared a, save, a slave free, sent him out in order that he should perform certain religious duties. So to sum up my first point, I'm arguing that just like Philo and Josephus, Rabbis were aware that the Roman practice of enfranchisement was widely touted as a mark of humanitas and benevolence. They too engaged in a competitive apologetic that sought to burnish Israel's humanitarian credentials by declaring an openness to interested Gentiles. There are limits to the rabbinic accommodation of Gentiles, of course, because lineage never ceases to play a role in the internal organization of the community. Moreover, the rabbis are not uniformly admiring of the Roman openness to foreigners. I'm thinking of a wonderful passage in Breshit Rabbah 63.8, where one rabbi mocks the Roman propensity to elevate anyone to the mantle or toga, reminiscent of Seneca's mockery of Claudius. 
Nevertheless, the point remains that some rabbis, like Philo and Josephus, were motivated by the Roman ideology of enfranchisement to advance a competitive portrait of their community's welcoming embrace of foreigners, even as they maintained a view of Israel as a separate people. Which leads to the second point I would like to make. The rabbis invoke the ideology of enfranchisement, not merely to imitate it, but to improve upon it. They critique this ideology and offer in its stead what they see as a superior model for the incorporation of foreigners that does not erase particular identities or fidelity to ancestral customs. This becomes evident as we look in greater detail at the nature of the accommodation of the foreigner that is imagined in this text. Already in the Bible, some descendants of Yitro the Kenite, uh, known as the Rechabites, are said to dwell alongside the Israelites in the land. And as we learn in Yirmiyahu 35, they are teetotaling you know, nomads who have followed their own ancestral traditions for centuries. Other descendants of Yitro the Kenite are said in Second Chronicles to be scribes. But our Midrash goes much further than the Bible in imagining the incorporation of the descendants of Yitro into the community. The scribes of Second Chronicles are seen in this source and in the Sifre Bin Bar um, as full-blown Torah scholars, disciples of a teacher named Yavetz. But there's more. According to one rabbi in Sifre Bamid Bar, some descendants of Yitro became members of the Sanhedrin, the high court that administers and adjudicates the laws of the Torah. And still others became priests administering before God in the temple. Now, the Midrashic impetus for these last two claims is God's promise in Yirmiyahu in chapter 35, verse 19, that a Rechabite will stand before him always. The rabbis take this to, to mean the Rechabites will stand literally before the Lord, a phrase that means in the sanctuary on the temple mount. And therefore, they will either be in the chamber of hewn stone the meeting place of the Sanhedrin, or the sanctuary itself where they will serve as priests. Significantly, in Yirmiyahu, God makes this promise as a reward for the Rechabites' fidelity to their own ancestral customs. In other words, their profound integration is paradoxically a direct result of their preservation of their distinctive identity. So the Rechabites and Kenites depicted in this Midrash conform really to the biblical conception of the Ger. They are resident aliens living as a distinct entity within Israel, honoring Israel's laws and God, engaged in its institutions, but also observing ancestral traditions of their own, retaining a separate identity. When Yitro goes out le gaillère to make gerim of his countrymen, he does not go out to convert them, uh, and we should avoid such a translation. I, I left those words untranslated in the text. There's no loss of Kenite identity or acquisition of an Israelite identity. These figures are continuously identified as Rechabite or Kenite for generations. Rather, Yitro causes them to reside within Israel and participate in Israelite society. So in this text, then, Giyor refers not to conversion from one identity to another, but to co-residence, to participation in the educational, judicial, and even cultic institutions of the Israelite people, participation through cultural fluency, we might say, and even intermarriage with priestly families, all without erasure of a distinct identity. In this Midrash, it's imagined that the retention of a distinct identity can be compatible with a high degree of functional membership and communal participation. In other words, this Midrash moves beyond burnishing Israel's humanitarian credentials by demonstrating Israel's accommodation of foreigners in imitation of Rome's. As part of its competitive apologetic, it offers a counter model of accommodation of foreigners in which a profound degree of incorporation is achieved without the loss of particular identities and ancestral loyalties. Like Rome, it is saying Israel is generous and welcoming of foreigners, but our accommodation is superior to Rome's in that it does not come at the cost of distinctive identities. One last observation, um, this passage challenges the common scholarly assertion that um, contrasts the biblical ger and the rabbinic ger. It is widely maintained that in rabbinic texts, the term ger refers to a religious proselyte who has taken on Israelite identity and not to a resident alien as it does in the Bible. While that is often the case, it is not always the case, and it is not the case here. And I suspect there are many other rabbinic texts in which the term ger has been incorrectly construed as a religious convert, when in fact it can connote resident aliens enjoying various degrees and types of integration without assimilation. 
It's important to be alert to this error in light of the increasingly popular assumption that rabbinic sources operate with a simple binary of Jew, non-Jew, and conceive of Giur as a passage from the latter to the former. This unnuanced view is anachronistic in its understanding of conversion and distorting of our sources. The terms Ger and Giur are used in rabbinic sources to imagine various kinds of affiliation and various degrees of foreign participation in and incorporation in the community. They don't follow a simple single template. Um, as is suggested when we use the, the term convert and the standard conception of a religious convert. No one is denying that the rabbis, like all human groups, had a macro level binary conception of self and other, all groups do. And that's usefully deployed in some contexts, especially legal contexts. But at the very same time, like all human groups, they also exhibit a healthy awareness that both of those macro level categories, self and other, are complex and composite, even the self has priest, Levite, Israelite, Gare, um, exhibiting a great internal variety that can be teased apart and differentiated in other contexts. So I think that rather than plotting lines of linear diachronic development, that Israel went from an ethnicity to a religion, that the Gare went from being a resident alien to a religious convert, that the Bible's variegated view of the Gentile became a simple binary view of Jew non-Jew uh, in rabbinic literature that admits no variety. I think we would do better to recognize that cultures can do more than one thing at a time. They are always complex and polyphonic. Certain ideas will come to the fore and dominate without erasing other ideas and then fade into the background as subaltern ideas gain currency. And then they will reemerge, perhaps in slightly modified form to become dominant again when cultural conditions are ripe. This, this kind of cultural shift um, is referred to by Moshe as a process of dominantization. And attending to these shifts um, provides, I think, a more accurate portrait of Israelite identity discourse and related discourses of the Gare. Thank you so much, Michal. Did I make 16 minutes? 16 and a half. You're good. Thank you. Moshe? Okay, so uh, thank you, Kristen, uh, for introducing the concept of dominantization, which is exactly what I would like to demonstrate with the text I wrote. Uh, I just want to say a few introductory words. First, um, what I'm presenting today here in Gregorian um, University under the supervision of uh, Professor Blitzman, last month, uh, and um, we later, can't hear you. Audio is not good. It goes in and out, Moshe. It goes in and out. So, okay. And later on, and later on, developed into into other articles and 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 the book. And my main argument in the book, uh, the rabbinic conversion of Judaism, was that um, conversion in the Babylonian Talmud uh, is was there was a process of dominantization in which some concepts that have their seeds in earlier sources were ripened and were, I would say, not exaggerated, but intensified in the Bavli. One of those tendencies is, is that of a binary division, that the legal formation of Goy versus Jew in the Mishnah uh, provides a, a model, and the Bavli is demonstrating the way this model uh, penetrated into much many other layers, and 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 the process in which in which um, uh, the Bavli developed uh, aspects related to conversion has many 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 um, aspects. It, it is expressed in the image of the convert as a newborn. It is expressed in the suppression of missionary voices that exist in earlier rabbinic sources, and it is expressed. In, in the image of the convert as a scab, which is a Babylonian, almost we can say invention, and in the introduction or invention of the cult for conversion. And, and in that sense, I would like to say that I, the word invention is problematic because we have to realize that it is about processes. And if we have um, um, a sage, over, overlooking or supervising immersion in earlier sources, it is a step towards 
the, con the, the rabbinic conversion court, okay? So um, let me, let me uh, jump into the sources, um, even though I have another, another principle argument to say. Um, so there are many sources here, uh, one, one in Hebrew, the other is in English. I, I'm not intending to read uh, all of them. I, 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 if you look at the Hebrew handout uh, on, on the page number one, you see the procedure of conversion as it appears in the Bavli versus the way it appears in Masechet Gerim. Tractate Gerim, in many, many other cases, is in accordance with uh, traditions as we find them in uh, sources from the land of Israel, and therefore represent something which probably preceded the Bavli and not, the, and not otherwise. And you see the, um, in bold, the addition of Ushnei Talmidei Chachamim Omdim Al Gabav. And two, and two scholars are standing above him and supervising the immersion. And they are not there in Gerim, okay? Now, not only that they are not there in Gerim, um, in the, in, when the Bavli is commentate, co com commentating about the source, which is already transformed, the Tanaitic source was already tra transformed, but when the Bavli uh, uh, comment about it, Rabbi Chia, in, in um, the Talmud is asking, but Rabbi Chia, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan said that a convert needs three, which in other places explicitly express, uh, um, presented as um, the convert needs three, judgment is written in regard to him, namely the convert needs three people to supervise his conversion, which is a court, okay? Um, and behold, Rabbi Yochanan says to the Tana, to the, uh, we can say to the human hard disk that has to memorize the Tanaitic sources, Tnei Shlosha, recite three. So we see here two processes. One, we see that the Talmud is, preserving a Braita that was already reworked towards a more supervised conversion. And then the Talmud also records the amendment of this Braita uh, to fit entirely to the model of rabbinic, uh, uh, rabbinical court. Now, there is no, I didn't find a single reference in, in, in rabbinic works from the land of Israel uh, to a rabbinical court. We only find it in the Bavli. And in most cases, in such examples, you see how it is added. And, and um, two very, very strong examples are uh, the Braita, the Bavli attributed it to Tanaim, if it is, put, if it is included in a Braita. But, it's not in this, but the Braita has, it has parallels in the land of Israel where the code of conversion is not included. And this writer in the English handout, you can find it um, in the beginning as the first source. And judge righteously between a man and his brother and, and the proselyte or resident alien, the ger, uh, that is with him. From this text, Rabbi Yehuda deduced that a man who was converted in a court is a convert but he who does so privately is not a convert. Now, according to the Babli, I would say the way the Tanaitic tradition is remembered in fourth century, fifth century, sixth century Babylonia, the Tanaim already established the court of conversion. Here, Rabbi Yehuda said, said so, but there's no documentation of that in earlier sources. Now, actually, when we read the second part of this Braita, we can see that even in this second part of the Brighter, there is a reminiscent of the previous model. Okay, now let's read that. It once happened that a man came before Rabbi Yehuda and told him, I have converted privately. Rabbi Yehuda said to him, have you any witnesses? He said to him, no. Have you any children? He said to him, yes. He said to him, um, you are trusted as far as your own disqualification is concerned, but, not, but you cannot be trusted to disqualify your children. I won't get here to the complexity of approving his children, even though he is not being approved. I just want to show you that the story, does, the, the, 
that does not negate private conversion with conversion by court, but private co conversion is negated with uh, witnessed conversion. Do you have witnesses to your conversion? Okay. And even with this, so you see within this brighter, there are two layers. The earlier layer, witnessed conversion was the supervised conversion. The latest layer, called conversion, is the supervised conversion. And, and, it, and in a similar case, um, we, we can see the comment of, of uh, ooh, maybe I did not include it here, sorry. Mm -hmm. So it's only, it's only in Hebrew in the first, in the second page on top of the second page. In the beginning of another Braita in this set of uh, Braita on conversion procedure in the Bavli, uh, he who came and said, I am a convert, can we accept it? Um, you, you should learn from the verse with you, with the one who is held for you, that you know that he, you, have, you have any, you know something about him, you know that he's a convert. So if someone just saying, I'm a convert, you cannot accept. But if he, if he came and his witnesses are with him, can we accept him? That, that's the question. Just one minor comment that in the, in the Sifra, in the land of Israel, is instead of can we accept it, is can you in, 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 in singular, can you accept it? Again, the many are the court. But the real introduction of the court into this Braita is in the words of the Amora Rav Sheshet. So the Talmud is asked, well, if he came with his witnesses, why do we need a verse to support, uh, to support the idea that someone that has witnesses is indeed, uh, is indeed, a, co is indeed a, uh, a convert? Amar Rav Sheshet, Rav Sheshet said that they say, we heard that he converted in a certain court. You could have said that we won't believe them, uh, but no, we will believe them. So you see, what is the witnessing? It's not that they witness the conversion, maybe the immersion. I don't know exactly what is to witness a conversion when there's no court for conversion, but uh, to witness the conversion, which is what the writer is speaking of, is to, 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 to see or to, or to hear about conversion in court. And um, there are... Uh, there are, there are Few other examples for that procedure, again and again and again, you compare the source from the Babylonian Talmud to the one from the Palestinian Talmud or from Ebraita, and you see that the concept of, of, con, of, 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 of court is not there. So, um, so instead of, 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 of um, showing more other examples, I want to say something about about the, the, how meaningful it is, uh, this in, the, 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 those innovations, which the Bavli reflects the ripened stage of those innovations. Okay, and when saying so, I, I say, I don't know when exactly they invented, but the Bavli has the picture in which it, it's already all there. And they are very important because the Bavli is the most influential work on later, uh, Jewish practices and, and the presence of the Bavli in our conscious. You know, I, I taught for a few years in the Reform uh, Seminary in London. I was amazed to learn how central is the rabbinical court for Reform rabbis. And it's amazing to see that the idea of a court, which is the most innovative aspect in, in the Bavli in regards to conversion, is so strong among all strands of contemporary Judaism. And, or, or another example, um, the negative statement uh, converts are as, as, as difficult to Israelites as a scab. There is a, an oration, a neum of, of begging uh, from the 50s, I think around the issue of, of, uh, of the compensation from Germany, where he is saying, for 2000 years, the Jewish separatism kept us, as we say, uh, Converts are difficult for us. As a, so you see, what was what was only finally um, crafted in the Bavli is assumed to be almost we can say the the eternal Judaism as shaped by the rabbis, and therefore the process 
is less felt. Okay, now what was the process in previous stages? How exactly it developed? I don't know. But I think that uh, the lecture um, this morning uh, of Dominique showed us another example for dominantization thinking in which there were few elements in biblical culture that were all, and when you take them all together, suddenly you have something which resembles the later rabbinic convert model. Okay, so we need to consider processes in their complexity and to see how minor elements in earlier stage become into central perceptions in, in, in later stages. And the question you were asked by Ariel, who is not here now, demonstrated the other view in which there must be, it's a watershed, okay? There must be a watershed, a biblical conversion, rabbinic conversion, they cannot be related. It's simply, the rabbis are, are anachronistic. Yes, they are anachronistic, but this anachronism is, is also part of a continuous development. And we need to see both, both the anachronism and the continuous development. Okay, 15 minutes, yeah. Okay. I want to... Now we can't hear you, Michal. Maybe you can turn it more to you. It was really good with Moshe, so better maybe... this way. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, here I'm talking to you. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the first is from Tractate Psachim. And I wanna uh, and I wanna read uh, um, I'll read the Hebrew and then translate into the English. Amar Rabbi Elazar lo egla kadosh baruch hu Yisrael lebavel ela kadeshi tvasvu aleim gerim. Rabbi Elazar said, "The Holy One, blessed be He, exiled Israel among the nations only so that converts would join them, as it is stated. And I will sow her to me in the land. Bezrati ali ba'aretz." Does a person saw a sea of grain for any reason other than to bring in several core of grain during the harvest? So too, the exile is to enable converts from the nation to join the Jewish people. So we have the first statement saying that the entire concept of exile, the entire reason for the Jewish people being in exile is to enable uh, Girim to join, right? Converts to join. That's the first passage that's in tractate. Uh, uh, now I'm going to move to uh, tra uh, tractate uh, uh, Yevamot. Uh, this is some of the passages are found actually in Moshe's handout. Uh, so the first one is a, is, a, is obviously a famous one, uh, parallel in Sechet Gerim, the, the, the process of Gerut. And, and it starts like this. Tanu uh, Rabanan, Ger Sheba Litgayer Bazman Azeh, Omer Lo Mara Ita Shebata Litgayer. A rabbi is taught a potential convert who comes to be converted. They say to him, why have you decided to approach us to be converted? And so what, what do they say to him when he does that? He says, Yata yodea shi Israel bazban azeh dovim, tchufim, schufim umetorafim. Behold, you see that this nation is downtrodden and tortured more than all the other nation and that many diseases and affliction came upon them. Im amar, yodea ni veni kedai mekablim otomiyah. If he says, I know and I'm unworthy, they accept him immediately. Right? And then they tell him what kind of uh, that he needs to do. That's passage number two, meaning uh, this is a, the, the point where the girl wants to join in and they inform him, you need to know what the bargain that you're getting. So this is what it is, right? It's, it's, it's a tough, it's, it's, not, it's not a great bargain. And if he says that he agrees to join, that's and the third passage I want to talk about is also from Tractate Yevamot, but a little farther on. Uh, and it says, it's a bright eye, and it says, Tanya Rabbi Hanina ben Gamuliel Omer, mi pnema girim bazman hazem meunin veisurin baim alehim. Rabbi Hanina, the son of Rabban Gamuliel, said, why are converts oppressed at this present time and affliction, and affliction come upon them? Because, and, okay, and then the Baita continues, and if we have time, we'll, we'll discuss it, and it gives a few answers, right? Uh, maybe because they didn't commit, they didn't uh, observe the seven uh, rules of the uh, Noahide commandments, the Sheva Mitzvot to the Noach. Maybe because they're not as um, acquainted with all the specific commandments and the third opinion as they do it, not from love but from fear. 
And the last opinion is because they delayed the entry under the rule. Yeah. Okay, so we have a few options of why the status of the Congress is as bad as Okay, so now I wanna uh, reflect a little bit about the concept and what when I was reading and preparing for this, and I really uh, relied very, very heavily on Moshe's book, a wonderful book that really uh, uh, does a lot to, to uh, uh, highlight the, the main issues and philological examinations of the text. Uh, what struck me about it is the concept of isuim, of, of, of uh, um, suffering or, or uh, being in a, in, in a bad state and the connection to that, to the concept of girim. Right, so um, there's nothing. So this is really related to the, the the title of the conference, the status of the gurim. Right, I, I don't want to talk about the, the the process. I don't even want to talk about uh, what does gurim mean. How do you transform? I want to talk about the status of the conference. And 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 what's interesting to me is that conversion is not fun. Right, so it's it's directly tied to the concept of suffering. In, in almost all aspects, and it really surfaced and it goes back and back. I can tell you how many times the word suffering appears in your book, Moshe. And it, 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 really, it really comes out. And it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, um, so in the first text, right? The Jewish people suffers, goes into exile for decades, right? And the, and, and the reason is, is to bring in converts. But this whole catastrophe of the galut, Right, of, of being away is for the purpose of bringing back the giving. That's the sole purpose of this whole catastrophic event of destruction. And it's for Girim, but it's horrific, right? But that's that's what it, it's for. Uh, when the girl joins in, it's not a happy occasion. Fine, we can talk about why they do it in such a way, but that's what they tell him. You're joining, uh, I don't know. The, a sucky group. This is not. This is not. This is. This is. This is not a good. Not a good group to join. We suffer. You're gonna join a group that suffers, and only if he shows that he is aware of that and is willing, and he says, "I'm not even worthy of that," or whatever, then he can join and, and we accept him. But this is. But this is. This is again, not a fun process, and it's very uh, highly uh, um, uh, showed. And the third text, which I find most. Then they joined, and now they're here, and they're worse off than us. They're like a group that suffers more than the rest of us. We suffer in general, but then they join us, and they're worse off. They're like a group that's even... Uh, 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 I'm trying to find the right English word, but uh, it, 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 there are really... If we're talking about the status of the converts, the converts, this is there's there's a really re, uh, realization and there's a, a, a admission that they are in a very bad place within the Jewish people once they convert, right? They're, they're treated badly and they're uh, uh, and, and they have isuim, they suffering come upon them. Now, there's a progression between the three sources. Again, I don't claim that they are a process, right? I, I made it. I, when you look at the three sources together, yeah, they're. they're the first one, we're happy about this, right? There's, there's a where, oh, we went into exile to, to make them join us, right? But the, uh, the second one, we're already trying to like push them away to like, already says that it's bad. But notice the difference in the first the, 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 the historical, uh, historical situation, right? We're trying to ask in the first text, we're trying to ask, why is there galut? Why is there, why do we go away? Why did we have to go through this catastrophe of the exile? We're asking about historical circumstances and we're trying to find the big answer. What's the, the divine purpose of exile? And the divine purpose is something that has to do with any that are in exile. This is something that God wanted to happen or your destiny wanted to happen. To join Girimin, right? We're all part of the divine plan and this is what it was. The third text also asks about historical purpose. It says, why? As a given, the group of Gerim converted horribly. They're suffering and they're in their bad place. It's also about a historical circumstance. And here it's no longer about a divine plan. We're into victim blaming now, right? Because they, they 
all the commandments. They, uh, whatever, what did we say? They don't do it from love, but for uh, fear of God. They delay their entry, right? It's their fault. This is why once they join, they're in a bad place. So Israel is suffering in the exile, but they're suffering for a divine purpose, right? The Gerim are suffering because it's their fault. Suffering is, is is good, but 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 it's not in the it is, well. It's, it's not that good, but it's it's there and it's connected to Gerim, but it's it's not treated in the same way, right? The way we're looking at historical circumstances, or I wouldn't say circumstances, but historical destiny, right? There's a destiny for exile, and there's a destiny for for Gerim. Once you join in, we warned you that you're joining a suffering people. We didn't warn you that once you join, you'll be suffering more than the suffering people you join. Right? Because you delayed and you're not doing this properly or whatever, right? So there's some, there is something, I don't know, dramatic that happens when we're, when we're looking at it. I'm not saying it's a fatal factor, it's not someone saying, I'm, I'm no uh, And I'm not, I'm not claiming that there's one author, believe me, I'm one of the skeptics, but I'm, I'm trying to, to think of the different thinkers that came up with those different uh, sessions. And when you're talking about suffering and hearing, we can really see different uh, different ways of making this sad. And uh, and the, all the texts that I've joined in together, they're dealing with converts and suffering and what happens when you join and why would you join and why uh, uh, exile, etc. And when I'm Thinking about suffering, we can think about suffering and conversion. I don't know if we just, you know, we'll do like a, an imaginary, I would say, what do you think about suffering? Still a theological or something about the change that the game is going through or the process that is going. This is not what this is about historical a question. This is about social standing. This is about um, yehud, uh, purpose in suffering. Why would you suffer? It has nothing to do, and none of those texts deal with um, the meaningful process that we've all been, you know, touching at different angles. I mean, what does it mean to convert? What does it mean to join the other group? What does it mean to join a suffering group? Right? What does it mean to choose to suffer? What does it mean not to choose to suffer, but they suffer anyway more than the suffering group? You None of it deal with the ramification or the theological ramification of it or the, the divine uh, intervention in the implication of suffering or the choosing of suffering, which I find uh, uh, interesting, uh, not very surprising when it comes to the rabbis, but still interesting. Uh, and, uh, and, and lastly, I want to go back to what I did. I, I, I took three different passages from two different uh, two different dates and two different places, and I tried to uh, um, um, make them into a process, right, from different stages and process of converts. And and I only did this because of the theme of a common theme of suffering, right? I'm I'm very much aware of that, but I want to um, um, still I still think it's worthwhile when we're looking at a theme to see its different manifestation in different author and different passages and think what it can tell us about when we're trying to uh, think of the world, of the complex world of the rabbis and how they approach that. And, and I'm done exactly in 15 minutes. Okay. Hey. Okay, so now what we're going to do, and I'm going to know how we do it uh, with Chris. Um, Chris, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, do, I'll put Chris in a speaking mode. Can you see her? And uh, do you want to? I don't. I, it doesn't matter to me. So okay. I'm happy to talk like that. I, I, I think. Can, can I make a few comments on yeah, these presentations? Um, so people should know. Yeah. Can't hear you. Each of us. Yeah. 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 Right. So. Um, People should know that we have not heard or read each other's presentations, so uh, it's just great to be hearing this now. And I immediately um, wanted to make some connections between um, Moshe and, and Michal's um, talk, which 
because I'm thinking of them now are only half baked, but I think they're things that it would be fun to pursue. Um, but first, just one comment um, for Michal. Uh, you know, the explanation of suffering, of course, is an ancient activity um, stretching back to the beginning of time. And of course, the biblical authors already give us different models for understanding Israel's own suffering, which do vary between the, the two that you've indicated that they're suffering for a divine purpose. The suffering servant, for example, of Isaiah, Israel is the suffering servant. It is suffering for a purpose, etc., to be a light to the Gentiles, interestingly enough, um, or the opposite, you know, the Deuteronomistic historian makes it very clear that the, pun the exile is your fault. It's punishment for your sins. Job is going to push back against that. So we have these tensions. So um, I think that it makes a lot of sense to think that they would also um, think about the suffering of Gerim and, and provide you know, alternative um, models for understanding that. But the connection I see between the two, um, and Moshe, um, you talked about witnesses, of course, and I, and I love the way that along the way in your talk, you said, of course, what they're witnessing to is unclear, because I had scribbled that down in my notes in the Palestinian sources. What are they witnessing? Are they witnessing the fact that this person has been a, a loyal member of our community, has um, always observed these particular laws, has, has, has you know, given tribute uh, to our God? What, you know, what are they witnessing to? Uh, and why do you need external witnesses, it implies that they're witnessing to behavior, something visible, you know, as opposed, as opposed to a, a modern or Christian notion of conversion, which is why I think it's anachronistic to use the word convert um, to talk about the gear. But, the, you know, that I don't need witnesses to have my come to Jesus moment, right? That's an internal process. It's some conversion away from death to life, from lack of faith to faith. And that's an internal process. You don't need somebody to observe you doing something. So I wondered about that. What are they witnessing? Let's keep in mind that the word, um, when we talk about witnesses, we have a contemporaneous a community of Christians who are involved in martyrdom. And the word martyr in Greek means witness. The late Latin then also martyr is to witness. And how did they witness? They witnessed by suffering death. They witnessed by suffering death rather than sacrificing to the Roman gods or, uh, right? So, there are perhaps some interesting, perhaps that's part of the conversation here as the rabbis think about what it is to witness in their context, as opposed to the witnessing to identity and particularly fidelity to divine, a divine cult uh, in other contexts, which means, you know, suffering unto death. Now, I know there's a literature on martyrdom uh, and competing notions of martyrdom in Christianity and Judaism, and we could talk about Daniel Boyarin's work and so on. But I just, I, I wonder whether that um, notion of, of suffering as witness informs both the text that Michal brought and also the text that Moshe brought. Are the rabbis offering an alternative understanding you know, to, to take on our identity? Doesn't, when we talk about witnesses, we're talking about something in a legal context and observing people's loyal behaviors or a later an immersion and a circumcision or later some other court process of interrogation. But it means those kinds of things and not some sort of dramatic spectacle of suffering unto death. But at the same time, that dramatic spectacle of suffering unto death is informing other aspects of rabbinic literature and maybe some of the things that Michal is pointing to where we might see that side of things emerging. So those were just your two talks I thought were just so terrific to bring together some of those ideas. Yeah, so first uh, about the question, what are they witnessing? Um, it, it, it might be that it, 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 they witnessed the immersion, right. which was the most important element, even though sub only after um, circumcision. Uh, however, your comment about uh, martyrdom um, is, is related to my, my main response to Michal's lecture um, um, texts, which is maybe suffering is mentioned a lot in my book, but I never discuss it because I didn't know what to do with it. I really, it was something which I did not understand when I worked on the subject. And I must admit, I, avoid, I avoided it. And only now for the first time, I had a, a certain idea, thanks to your comment that on the discussions on Christian martyrdom and its relation to missionary activity and the way martyrdom was also evidence to the, um, to the strengths of Christianity. So maybe this suffering is related to that. 
and 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 originally the motif of of the suffering convert is relay is is coming from the period in which we have more missionary traditions okay that that's that's maybe for a, a, a suggestion uh now um so so and, and Moshe, I just can I just interrupt to say, and it's not um, it's not a, a, a phenomenon confined to the Roman world. Of course, we have the the Syrian Persian martyr acts. We we know that in the Babylonian environment and what's going on in the Syriac community that there there's familiarity with these notions of martyrdom. Yes, yes, yes. okay. So it just you know just an idea that popped my mind. Oh my God. Now, and, and, so I will return to missionary. Uh, and the suppression of missionary traditions uh, in a minute, but when I return to Michal's um, text, but first I want to say something about the text, uh, Christian, you provided us, that it seems that um, your, your, that your text has an echo with the Torah's presentation and the possibility that the model of of, of Gerim as a, an identity that does not leave you and stay with you. Um, it appears both in, both in, um, in, in uh, Qumran and in rabbinic sources, according to, if, if we accept the reading of, of the two of you. And, 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 and that gives me a, a thought about those elements in which we do find parallels between early Tanaitic Palestinian sources and second temple sources. And um, while in the Bavli, it, um, we, we, we no longer fi find those tendencies. And, 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 and I see this phenomena, so, so, so a, a convert who was, who, whose mother was a convert, which is in the Mishnah Kiddushin, is an echo is an echo of the old model, right. and also also the model of the convert that is um, um, oh, there is a nice English word for that, but I just forgot it. Uh, the the convert that denounces his property. Okay, yes. it's a model that appears in Tanaitic sources, in Joseph and Athenath and other Second Temple images, and and um, almost disappear entirely later on. So there is so so when we in yeah, but in the Bible, it, 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 you want you 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 will hardly find it. Okay, now so 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 sometimes the processes of development that we imagine where, where do we put the, the watershed? We we so we we are so accustomed to put the watershed um, between uh, Second Temple uh, late Second Temple period and rabbinic sources, but sometimes uh, it, it can be shifted. Uh, towards later developments within rabbinic literature, and and if we want to 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 search for such arguments even in a more extreme way, is that the uh, the imagery of new of 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 the convert as a newborn, um, in 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 when 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 echoes of this imagery in rabbinic in Palestinian rabbinic literature are closer to, they come together with with. Christian Western sources versus the Bavli. So here, where do we put the split? Okay. So those Westerners in the land of Israel, whether Christian or rabbinic Jews, have a certain language, and I, I speak here about only about uh, between about expressions. While in the Bavli, there is a, a different language. Okay. Um, la last comment, uh, going back to to Michal's lecture and the missionary images. It is that um, somehow uh, the text you presented include two of the rare cases in which the Bavli did not suppress missionary tendencies. And in other cases, it's either that missionary traditions disappear or that they are internalized. And instead of speaking about uh, the Jew um, missionary among the non-Jew, it's about the rabbi uh, educating the Jews. The same tradition, just with this minor change. Now, uh, and, and, and when I, I thought, what can I do with the sources that go against my theory? It's, it's not nice of them. <laughs> uh, what are they doing there? So first I would say, this is about domin dominantization. When some dominantization is a process, you, don't, you shouldn't expect the Bible to suppress everything. This is first. 
And second is that we can call it the chamutzim, uh, the, the pickle, the sour. So uh, when you do have a missionary tradition in the Bavli, it comes with why are we in exile, okay? Or why do, uh, why do converts come? Because they delay their conversion. So, so when the Bavli has, say, preserve mi a missionary tradition, it's with a kind of a negative tone or a kind of a uh, displ displacement, something like that. Okay, that, that, that's all my comments, Michal. And by the way, Michal, of course, since I see humor everywhere, I think there's a pun that galut and gerut because of the liquid syllable, a consonance of lamed and resh. So galut suggests to them gerut, but... <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, gurim, which is a negative uh, the, the way to to present them in a negative way and uh, and, and duplicating uh, and lamed uh, is sometimes it means to 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 denote the negative other and actually in the morning we had the asafsuf which is exactly the same it, those who are gathered, they is full, but they are asapsuf. And this duplication is, is a means to, to, turn to turn it down and... Can you hear me? No, move, the, move it right over to you. Moving, moving, moving. Okay, there you can you hear it? Yes. Uh, it's really like centimeters and then you can hear me. Uh, I, uh, I wanna thank Moshe and Chris because honestly this, this was... Uh, really fun and interesting and, and, and a way to, to start a conversation. And I'm glad we did this. Uh, I think what I take, because I have exactly three minutes, uh, uh, what I take from both your, uh, yours and his uh, talk is a call for complexity. And I think, uh, I think that's, we, we've spent the entire day talking about conversion from different angles. And I think if this is the one thing that we've learned today is the call for, for complexity when we're, we're trying to talk about the big picture. So both Moshe and his book, and today when, when the concept of demonization saying, stop, stop asking what, what, what was before and what does the Babli do, but, but start looking at the, the, the roots or the, the sources in which it does what it does, right? I'm making something more, you know, pop out uh, rather than others. When, and when Chris says, um, and, and so while Moshe does it during, during layers, right, of the Bavli, earlier sources and later sources, and what the Bavli does with it, and Chris, in this case, beautifully showed uh, Roman concepts and how they're used to, to, to present a counter uh, argument or, or, or a different accommodation, as, as she called it. Uh, again, a call for complexity, meaning we're, we're, call for complexity is banal, right? Because, I don't know, we did, we did, we did, black and white, and then we did complexity. And now we're going back in the uh, history of the scholarship, we're going back a little bit to black and white, right? There is, there is uh, we haven't mentioned Ishai Wazensvi's book, but others that are trying to, to show uh, uh, um, a black, and, and again, going back and saying, okay, we did the complex thing. Now let's say something a little bit more simplistic because we want to look at the big picture. And I think what Moshe and Chris uh, do in their, in their talk is say, we, we, we have to do the complexity a, 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 and even when we're trying to do the binary, right? So we're, 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 we're in like the fourth, thing, not the second and not the first, right? We're doing something, I know I sound uh, complex, but I, 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 I really think that this is an important call, meaning we're, we're, we're looking at the sources and we're trying to, de to detect connection to non-Jewish sources, right? Such as Roman concept, we're trying to locate uh, layers we did that already in stage number two. But even now, when we're trying to talk about the big picture and saying what changed, we want to do this while being complex in our and not simplistic in our thinking. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I managed to, to convey what I was trying to say, but I think we are in a good stage. And Moshe and Chris did it beautifully. Okay, could you, could you hear me, Chris? Absolutely, and it's really just about being responsible to all of the evidence and not um, saying, well, this is one thing and then I'll explain away all of the things that seem to push in the other direction, but to really come up with a capacious theory that allows us to be uh, responsible uh, for and responsive to all of the evidence in its complexity. Okay, so we have 15 minutes until our bus leaves for the restaurant. <laughs>
I'm going to open this for questions. Reflection. Suzanne, let me, let me. So first, I, I, I work talk, now. And, uh, and the court appears everywhere. And when uh, uh, so many exegetical narratives are putting the context of what happened within a kind of a, of, of a court context. Um, and so, so, and, and I think it's also, it's, it is very important to see how rabbinic development uh, appears both in Halakha and in Agada. So, for example, in the sources about the court form conversion that we have here, we have the, 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 the term that lo beyado, it's not in the hand of the convert, it is in the hand of the court. And in the Ag Agadic imagery of conversion in the story of Hillel of and Shammai, which allegedly um, uh, present Hillel and his model uh, as, as the preferred one, but this is the, there is the motif of, uh, of the hand. He pushed him with his hand because it is in the hand of Hillel or in the hand of Shammai, but not in the hand of the convert, okay? Yes, yes. And, 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 the, and, and my last comment about this is, is also, I, I want, even though I do, I, I, I agree with some critics with the, with the, with the feeling that Ishai's theory went far much towards uh, binarization, I, I do think that, uh, that the, the legalization of the terms Jew and Gentile in the Mishnah became such a strong mm -hmm. social and cultural agent. And I don't know what bothers Ishai more, the way it shaped the Babylonian uh, lit, uh, literature or what the way it's shaping contemporary Israeli society. <laughs> but I think that 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 the main issue with his argument is is there is that this uh, putting it into the into the legal language which which changed the concept of the self as there is as if it's the essence of the person and in, in that I agree with him that the Mishnah might be the watershed in that sense. Yes. Uh, get, oh, sorry. Is it okay to respond to Suzanne? 
Did you hear her? Did you hear her? I, I think I think I heard Suzanne. <laughs> so um, the two points that I think I heard, and if I'm responding to something else, then I apologize. But I mean, there is just in general an increasing institutionalization and rabbinization of everything. Moshe talks about this in his book, but it's it's not just about identity. It's on everything from you know determining menstrual impurity, as Charlotte von Robert has shown, and you know so it it, it creeps into all areas of life, and we don't. I think we have to be careful not to assume that this is specific to questions of Jew, non-Jew, and um, th this sort of categorization is going on. Um, the taxonomy of the Bavli, Bavli is extending to all areas of life, and this is just one. Um, and I think you're, you're right, um, Moshe, uh, about um, the Ros Rosenstein's theory. I think that for me, the main issue is, of, of course, it's true that there's dominantization. Of course, there are cultural shifts. We couldn't, wouldn't be able to do history if we weren't able to track those. But Ezra already, I mean, there's, a, I think that the effort to sort of explain away Ezra as not really binary is, is just a mistake. I mean, the Bible already has very binary discourses and non-binary discourses, and so do the rabbis. And so again, it's really a process of something dominant in Ezra's time. Then it's very much pushed into the background and under the Roman environment, that is not something that's emphasized. It will re-emerge in the Bavli, which is back in a Persian environment. So, I mean, I just think there's such a complex history to tell about those things that to say that that the Bible has no binary distinction between Jew and Gentile. And that is a rabbinic or invention or even Pauline invention. I just, I just think that's an exaggeration. We always have these competing ideologies of, of binary and more complex. But the other thing that Suzanne said when she talked about um, you know, Lashem Shemaim uh, and so on, look, we have these models already biblically some other work I've done that shows that we have many pathways into Israelite community, some that are through marriage, um, some that are through love of a mother-in-law, which is what Ruth is about. She says, I want to be part of your people. That means I know I have to worship your God, but I want to be part of your people. As opposed to Rahav, who says, oh, I've heard the fabulous things that your God has done. Your God is the one true God. I want to be part of your God. That is not Ruth. That's Rahav. The rabbis see that. The rabbis even hold them up as being very different, that Ruth is not, you know, there's the one famous passage that has the conversation between Naomi and Ruth um, cited as showing uh, Ruth's, you know, zeal for the God of Israel and that get out of my way, Naomi, I'm converting whether you want me to or not. That one passage is the only time the rabbis talk about Ruth that way. If you read Ruth Rabbah, she is not understood that way by the rabbis. She's understood as, as, as performing acts of chesed for her mother-in-law, and this was part of it. And she's not a Rahav that you know, contrast her. So I, I think that we have a tendency to somehow privilege, again, because of anachronistic modern notions that conversion is a converted faith faith stance done by the individual that thinks that the only authentic or genuine or good way to come into a community is because of personal religious reasons. Instead of valuing the way hundreds of thousands of people in biblical times and other times joined the community, which was through love, love of another individual. Maybe it was a spouse, maybe it was some other family member, but there are lots of pathways into the community. And I think we're looking for, well, when has it become true conversion, meaning religious, meaning authentic conversion, anything else is not genuine. And I think that's quite anachronistic. Yeah, you know, the, it's, it's this tricky situation in which um, because something is stated uh, uh, explicitly, it's actually because, because it's not there, you know, because it is there. That's your argument. And um, I, 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 I actually have no comment about this specific argument. Um, I just want to say that uh, many times when I presented the uh, the, the rise of uh, negative approaches towards converts or the suppressing of, of missionary uh, in, in, in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, I would say the most intuitive response of audience is that it is related to the loss of authority in Babylonia. And, and I wonder whether it's because they are all Zionists and they imagine the exile as, 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 as a place where we don't have authority. Uh, but I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. I just want to say one. Can you hear me, Chris? Chris, can you hear me? Wait. Now I Chris? can. Okay. Now I can. So one of the things that 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 Boyarin, uh, Boyarin shows in his book is the is the uh, is the lack of um, magic mag it's not majestical the lack of majestical majesty, majesty of, of 
of of of the of the martyrdom in in the rabbinic sources, right? So the Christian sources really raise up. It's very dramatic and it's very beautiful. And the the moment of the decision of the martyrdom, we don't have that. And besides those bunch of stories that we use in in, in Yom Kippur, and even there, it's you know it's 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 done badly because we don't know how to do this as well as we should. I don't. I, I see the connection that you're making to martyrdom, but I have to say, I've been thinking about it for the last 20 minutes. Um, there is something, L'Shem Shammai, right? They're doing it and they're joining, even though they're suffering, they're choosing to, to suffer with them, blah, blah. It's, it's pathetic. It's, 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 it's not fun. It's, it's awful. And it's their fault. And we all suffer for them to join us. There's something... Really, I started by saying it's not fun, and and this is the 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 the, the sense that I, I I I actually wanted to talk about something completely different. We asked Moshe and three weeks ago about this, and that we're going to talk about other things that we ended up talking about, uh, including me. And I and it just for me, it just stands out as being really pathetic and not fun. And the suffering here is is really truly. Uh, I kind of I, I, I'm thinking of of, of Danny Danny's face when he said uh, maus right about the the the, the foreskin right it's it, it's something disgusting it's something bad it's something that's not that's not good and I don't see the the majestical side of it the, I'm, I'm not, that's not the word I'm looking for. not the the dramatic the, the 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 glory of martyrdom I don't see it in the suffering here and I think it's very Jewishy of the of the rabbis to do it this way. Uh, and um, on this optimistic <laughs> uh, adjourning our, our, our session, and I want to thank Moshe and Chris for going along with uh, this video. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you. Chris, we're going to go eat, and we're, you're missing a fabulous dinner uh, uh, here in, 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 in Be'er Sheva, and we'll, we'll have to catch up again. And thank you all. Uh, bye, Chris. Thank you.